Welcome back to The World Over. He's an actor, band leader, and singer who's sold over 28 million records worldwide. He's won three Grammys, two Emmys, and earlier this year, he added daytime TV host to his resume. He, of course, hosts the syndicated talk show, Harry, and I sat down at CBS's studios in Manhattan to talk about his career, the roots of his music, and the faith that drives it all. Here's my exclusive interview with my fellow New Orleanian, Harry Connick, Jr. Harry, I want to talk about the show in a minute, but I first want to talk about you. How did you not study the law with a mother <laughs> who's a Supreme Court justice in Louisiana and a father who was the DA for, what, 30 years? Right. There was a lot of law, law in my house. My mother, just to be fair, was a small claims court judge. Okay. My dad was a DA. And I remember at one point when I was in my early 20s, my manager, who is a Harvard Law graduate, and her husband, who's a Harvard Law professor, I, I sought their counsel about maybe getting a law degree because I felt maybe this is something that I can do. And they sent me this big giant book on the law. I don't even think I opened it. I said, I see, I see your point. This is not my turf. I'm not going to do it. Didn't do it. No, no, no. You, that, that, I, I don't belong there. My parents, were, you know, they're, they're real intellectuals and, and they, both of them are brilliant lawyers, but that's just, my brain didn't work like now, that. Now, they also owned a record store. That's right. Which is probably where some of the love of music came from? Oh, I think a lot of it came from there. So my mother and father, when they were putting themselves through school in the late 50s, had a, a small record store called Studio A Productions, and they would sell the popular music of the time, you know, uh, Nat King Cole and Elvis mm -hmm. Presley and uh, Frank Sinatra and all that stuff. So by the time I came along in 67, obviously that they, they were out of that business, but they, they obviously had a lot of records that, mm. that they kept. So I heard music all the time because my parents were both huge lovers of not only great music uh, but but music that that was important music especially to me hmm. being a young musician where, where did the piano start you started very young my grandfather who had a restaurant around the corner from where you lived That's right used to complain <laughs> I remember him that little boy coming in here he's playing the piano he's taking all the business they're, they want to listen to him they're not eating they're business, not business was pretty good for me yeah I <laughs> noticed <laughs> I had some good tips where did that come from well, we had a piano in the house from as long as I can remember. Um, but even before that, my cousin Georgia used to play. And my sister, mm. who's a few years older than I am, would take lessons from her. And I sort of remember hanging out. And the story is that when she would finish her lesson, I would go and play the things that she had learned. It, it came very easily to me. Mm. It wasn't that I was some kind of prodigy. It was just very natural for me to sit down at a, at a piano and kind of pick notes out. So ever since I can remember, that's just sort of what I gravitated toward. Tell me a moment about Ellis Marcellus' sure. influence on your work. And I wanted to take a little step back. James Booker, this kind of flamboyant, great pianist, he, he accompanied everybody from Aretha Franklin to Fats Domino, he taught you. James was a, a friend of the family's mm -hmm. and used to come over. He, he, um, my dad always said he wanted to put James in the studio and record him because that's what he did to me when I was mm -hmm. like 9 and 11. I made a couple of albums. But he never did, and it's one of his great regrets. So mm -hmm. James would, I knew James from going to the Jazz Fest, and James mm -hmm. would like to show up at my house once in a while, sort of unannounced, and huh. give me piano lessons. Right. But I loved the time I had with him. What did you get from him? What did you get from Ellis Marcellus later at NOCA, which is the New Orleans Center of Creative Arts? That's right. I think between... Ellis's tutelage and James's sort of sporadic appearances, mm -hmm. you, you couldn't have a more complete spectrum of piano, of, of American jazz and rhythm and blues piano mm -hmm. playing. Ellis is a real music academic. I mean, so he, he understands um, not only the structure of music, but how to convey that information to young people. He's probably the, I would say, certainly the best music teacher I ever had. Mm. He, he was an incredible, and is an incredible pianist in his own right. But he would also allow us the discovery process just enough to keep us interested in, in wanting to acquire more information from him. Mm. James would basically, I'd say, James, uh, how, do you, how do you play this lick? And James would say, oh, this is how you do it. And I would sit and watch him and, and, and if I didn't understand something, he would show me. So it was a, it was a way, Different like Ellis would never sit down and show me. Ellis would say, well, you have to figure it out. Hmm. But the stuff I got from James, like he played things that nobody played before or since that were 
pretty much impossible to do. Wow. So to have his tutelage was an incredibly rare blessing. Incredible. Tell me about your mom for a minute, Anita. You lost her when you were 13. That's right. What is the lasting influence Boy, you know, that you find today? I, I think about her all the time. I think about the fact that she was, she's from New York. She was mm -hmm. brought up Jewish. By the time I knew her, she was pretty much non-denominational, but mm -hmm. she knew more about Christianity and the Bible than most Christians I know. She mm. was very well versed in the Bible um, and was an incredibly spiritual uh, woman um, that always treated me beyond my years. And I would see that with other people too, with my cousins or my friends. She would always sort of take the time to look them in the eye and, 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 and treat, treat them respectfully. She always made us feel very important. And I think the benefit of that was it helped us all, including me, to aspire great to, to greatness because she was treating us like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think about that a lot. I think about people that would come over to the house. Some of them were famous politicians. Yeah. Some of them were auto mechanics. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter. We didn't know who they were um, or what they did as little kids, but she treated everybody equally. It, 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 mm -hmm. it was an amazing thing to see in real time, to see somebody practice that. Because as I got older and I saw things like sexism or racism, mm -hmm. it didn't happen in my house. Like it didn't happen with my father. It didn't happen with mm -hmm. my mother. He, they, they would treat everyone the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gets drilled into your head over time and you start to realize the benefits yeah. of realizing that there's something to learn from, from everyone. Huh. So that's, that's a great lesson I learned from and, my mom. And you were raised Catholic, not right. Jewish, and, and not in, in an interfaith household. You didn't learn both faiths. Right, so when, when my mom was, when I knew her, she wasn't practicing anything, but my dad is a very devout Catholic, mm -hmm. still is at 90 years old, mm -hmm. and he would take us to church. But I wasn't baptized as a baby, and my sister wasn't either, because my mother wanted us to decide for ourselves huh. uh, what religion we wanted to be. So. I felt like I was part of the Catholic community because of my father, my mother's family was not in New Orleans. I was surrounded by these Irish Catholic mm -hmm. conics and I wanted to be a part of that. So I decided when I was 14, I wanted to be baptized, I wanted to be confirmed. Uh, and, and that's when I uh, joined the Catholic faith officially. Jumped in. Mm -hmm. you, you went to Jesuit high school. I did, school. Yep. Uh, Tell me about that time. This, there's very little reporting on it, but I can remember in high school, following high school, you were musical directing. You were doing, I mean, Sonny Borey, who was running the <laughs> theater program there, still a friend of yours, sure. I know. Um, you, you were really involved in, in creating, shaping musicals. I, 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 I was into the musical theater stuff as a result of Sonny Borey. He, he used to give me a, a lot of leeway, you know, with, with the orchestras during the, mm -hmm. the school productions and doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, I, I remember playing, there was a mime from Germany that was in town and she didn't speak any English and she had a couple of gigs and through an interpreter I found that she wanted me to just play what she was miming. miming. <laughs> and I, I remember my dad came to that gig and we still laugh about it because <laughs> that, that's not hard for me to do. It doesn't make me some musical genius but you just kind of sit there and if she's miming something that's supposed to be winter you play something that sounds like winter. And dun, it, dun, 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 well, dun, exactly dun. and it, it was it was an amazing experience playing in, in gospel music in churches, playing R&B, showing up mm -hmm. to a gig, and Walter Washington is there. I mean, was, I was inundated with a wide variety of, of experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and so all through my high school career is when I really, really started to stretch out, play more gigs. Because mm -hmm. that's sort of prep. That's why when I saw you wrote Thou Shalt Not, right. and you know a Broadway musical, you're composing this thing, people say, where is this coming from? Well, I knew where it came from. Right, right. And it's all kind of come from the same place. I mean, mm -hmm. making movies, doing Broadway, writing for Broadway, acting in movies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all sort of my brain, and I see things and hear things, things through that, th that lens, I guess. Uh, and it all seems similar to me, uh -huh. you know what I coming mean? Coming from the same place. It's coming from the same place. So the creative process is is the same. What what those various genres do for me is allow me to to sort of break through any default patterns that I might have. Mm -hmm. So when they called and asked me if I wanted to write the score to a Broadway show, I was forced to do things differently. I was I was forced to write songs that advanced a storyline, mm -hmm. which is something I never had to do before, and I had a lot of trouble with it because I was trying to write one-off songs, tunes, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I didn't want to sacrifice a song 
just to get the point of the show across, mm -hmm. which is a very selfish, immature way to do it. And I learned, I learned a lot on that experience. Awesome. So yeah. Now t tell me, Harry, Harry met Sally. Of course, exploded you everywhere. Was that limiting? Because they kind of cast you as the Sinatra, the new Frank Sinatra. Right. You've resisted that ever since, I might add. Well, it's not that I resisted it. I, I mean, Frank Sinatra was the greatest singer of all time. Yeah. I mean, uh, unquestionably to me, the greatest singer of all time. Um, but he wasn't much of a piano player, um, didn't write a whole lot of songs. So I, I never compare myself to him because I, I just don't see that many comparisons. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to talk about Sinatra, you have to talk about all of the other great male singers of all time that I, that I love too. Yeah. But when Harry Met Sally took off, and it turned me into a sort of a big band singer, which is a type of music that I never played. I had never, maybe once or twice I had played with a big band. So when I went on the road, I had three arrangements for the big band. It's hard to do a two hour show with three songs. So <laughs> somebody had to write the charts. So I started writing arrangements wow. for the big band and they were not good. They were passionate. Um, mm -hmm. We loved playing them, but I look at them now and I'm like, it was like a, <laughs> Chimp wrote these things. It was not not impressive, but that's how I learned. And because mm -hmm. I was on the road and performing, I had a chance to perform my arrangements and right away know this is wrong, this is right. So it expedited the process. So I'm very indebted to that uh, when Harry Sally experience because it, it it helped me grow very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, my sense is watching you do this new show, Harry, which is a for anyone who's ever done it, it's a tough thing to do, a daily show like this, and a, and a daytime show where you're shooting multiple episodes a day. Is it easier to guest rather than host? I like hosting better because, see, what you're, here, what you're doing, I'm, I'm really impressed with because you, you've clearly done a lot of research on me and you, you're making me feel like I'm the only person that matters to you right now. Mm -hmm. And you're really, really good at it. And that that's the... That's a great feeling. I think ultimately, even though it's a selfish feeling, all of us like to talk sure. about ourselves. Well, and this is what you do on the show. I mean, this, this woman you brought out earlier. Incredible. From, and, and we'll get to that. Though. Yeah. But I, I love I, that you're highlighting people who otherwise we wouldn't see. Well, that's, that's a, a great thrill for me. And I like talking about myself on, on talk shows, but, but I, I really um, like hosting the show because not only do I get to do all of the things I like to do, but I get to meet these incredible people. I want to do a really fun show, an aspirational show. I want to have my band there. I want to have great guests, and I want to celebrate women and family and community. And that's exactly what we're doing. It's mm. a it's a blast. It really well, is. You were drawn to the kind of Merv Griffin, Dean Martin vibe. What about that attracted you? Well, when I think of shows like Merv Griffin or Mike Douglas, I think those two people in particular. Um, both of them are musicians, and oh, both of them right. were um, really, really good at at what they did. But they were they were talk shows. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do a talk show because I I'm a musician. Um, and if you look at Dean Martin, Dean Martin's show was a weekly show uh, where he did not rehearse. Mm -hmm. in, in the history of television, <laughs> the only two shows I've ever heard of of people not rehearsing are Dean Martin's and mine. <laughs> I don't like to rehearse. I like to go out and. If Do I make it. mistakes, that's there's so, the much, there's so much gold there. Mm -hmm. um, so, but but he wasn't doing a daily show. So as much as I admire those shows and other shows, what we were trying to do, uh, there wasn't really a playbook for that. There wasn't really mm -hmm. a show mm -hmm. where the host was actually the musical director for the band, mm -hmm. where the host was actually physically writing out trumpet parts and alto saxophone parts, <laughs> and that's what I do. So. I, I, again, it's not hard. It's, it's a lot of work, but I love to do it, and we're trying mm -hmm. to do something different. So, do you think it. TV has become too political? I, I, I don't know. Because this is a political free zone in your show. It's. I mean, if somebody wants to come on and talk about their political views, I'm not going to stop them. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen much. Once in a mm -hmm. while, it happens. It's. I mean, there are a lot of sources to get politics on TV. A lot of great sources. Um, some of them, you know, are, are better than others. But you, you won't have a hard time hearing about politics on TV. Right. I wanted to give people a respite from that. I wanted to do a show that didn't talk about politics because especially now, I think it's very clear that we're very divided as a country. Mm. And yet, when you think of things from the perspective of family and faith and community, we pretty much are all very similar, no matter what you believe. I mean, if you, if you don't bring politics into the equation or even religion into the equation, it's amazing how much we as Americans have in, in common. common. Most parents want to 
do the best they can for their kids. Mm -hmm. Most people are hardworking. Um, we're all the same like that. So mm -hmm. I, I, that's that's what I want to want to talk about. They can get yeah. the the heavy stuff somewhere else, yeah. but I, I wanted them to to be inspired and and. Uh, to, to have some joy from this show. Yeah, and you see that. You feel it in the audience, too. I mean, I was, I was sitting out in the crowd, and you, even in between breaks, people are talking. They're, they're, particularly, this, there's, a, there's a segment you have called Harry's Leading Ladies. Right. And it's where you focus on unsung heroes. Right. Tell me about that. Whose idea was that? Well, I had a bunch of ideas when we started this show, um, and one of them was Leading Ladies. I said, listen, my grandmother was amazing. My mother was amazing. Mm. My wife, my three daughters, my manager, who I've been with for over 30 mm -hmm. years, I'm surrounded by incredibly bright, very strong, very independent women. That's all I know. Mm -hmm. I want to see more of that. There's a million of them out there. I want to meet them all. I said, mm -hmm. can we do it every day? Because I want to mm -hmm. celebrate them. And I, I really respect them. And every single time one of these women is on, and it's very frequently. It's like the first thing I do the after the show, I'll go back into my dressing room and I'll see my little team of people. And I say, man, that was unbelievable. How lucky am I to be inspired? It makes you want to be better. And, 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 and when you showcase that, boy, I just think somebody's going to bound out of their house one day wanting to to help. It's so yeah. inspirational. Well, and the, and the, the power of that it's going incredible. out and the positive influence of right. it. Do you see this whole show as your faith in action? I know you wanted to avoid preaching, and you do. But the whole show, it seems to me, is sort of your faith being displayed, moving. It's a really good question, and I've been asked many times sort of if my faith informs the decisions that I make on right. TV. Um, I don't, I'll be perfectly frank yeah. with you. I'm a Catholic. Yeah. I'm a very proud Catholic. Yeah. Um, I'm not a perfect Catholic. In fact, I always say I'm a practicing <laughs> Catholic. I'm gonna keep practicing until I get it right. Um, I have a lot of work to do. Uh, and I talk to my father virtually every day about mm -hmm. things like faith, um, mm -hmm. things that the Catholic Church teaches. Mm -hmm. We argue. In, you know, not in a nasty yeah. way, yeah. but we go back and forth, uh, primarily because he's the superior knowledge with it, and mm -hmm. there might be some generational differences, but we always have these substantive talks about it. Mm -hmm. It's something I'm deeply interested in and, and, and is a very, very, very important fundamental part of my life. Mm -hmm. But I don't really think about that when I'm performing. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's because I have a philosophy about how to get the message across. Mm -hmm. They say that when you teach a dog to fetch, if you throw the ball and the dog gets the ball and comes back to you, if you pull the ball out of the mouth of the dog, he's not going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. You have to let that dog voluntarily, you say, drop, drop, and, when he, and you have to teach him how to empower the dog to do it himself. I think it's a similar kind of thing with how you get the message of faith across. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be preached to unless you go to church. Some people do, um, and, and, it's, and it's great, and some people do it so well. My guitar player, Jonathan DuBose, has his own church, the Agape Fellowship, and it's a hmm. terrific church in Bridgeport, Connecticut. He is a preacher. Hmm. You cannot have a conversation with him without being preached to, <laughs> and I love it. So I was incorrect by saying nobody yeah. wants to be preached yeah. to. I, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. So how do I do it? And, and it's not like I'm trying to preach. What makes me feel good? It makes hmm. me feel good to celebrate life, to celebrate love, to celebrate faith, family, community and how do I how do I do that I, I had the pleasure of talking to to uh, his eminence uh, Cardinal Dolan about this very thing and he said so you kind of want to come through the back door you kind of want to have a like a breakfast table conversation and not really hitting it on the head and I, I said yes I, I think that's what I want to do he mm -hmm. says you know the church needs that and I didn't mm -hmm. think about it like that he said people need to hear the message in in different ways mm -hmm. and I thought about it and I'm like well maybe Maybe God made me an imperfect, curious Catholic. My dad calls me Thomas, by the way, <laughs> because I'm always firing these questions at him. Maybe that's my purpose. Maybe mm -hmm. my purpose isn't to be a good preacher, but to walk hand in hand with the majority of us who really are trying to figure this stuff mm -hmm. out. Because at first, I used to think I have to represent my faith and I have... I, 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 I don't have the power to do that. Well, you're doing that. I would argue you're doing that. You've been married for 27 years. You're a father first right. and a husband. 
And when I see this, I've always thought, you want to be a good Catholic and you want to advertise the faith, just do what we do in New Orleans. <laughs> right. Feed people, entertain them, make everybody <laughs> happy, and bring everybody together. That's what you're doing here. Well, it's, it's, you know, to hear like that is really refreshing because that's what it, that's what it is for me. That's, that's a lived, lived experience. experience. Yeah, and when you look at people and you see, you know, Raymond, I go out in the audience during commercial breaks, mm -hmm. some people are crying. You hold their hands and, and you and they cry and they say, thank you. And, and I'm not fishing here by any means, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking to myself, like, what are you thanking me for? I'm up here, I got my name on the marquee. Like how much more attention could be on me? But that that's what, I think God wants me to do that. Mm. I think that's what I'm supposed to do. Mm. I'm supposed to entertain people and try to make them feel good. You know, we're all mm -hmm. trying to connect the dots here. And if yep. I can just, man, if I can do that for an hour a day, I feel like I'm, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. What do you want to do next? I know you're a restless spirit. I am. You can't do just one thing. No, I can't. You know, I'm always reading new movie scripts and writing new projects. And after hosting this show, I think I've done, I don't know what else there is to do. <laughs> like, I mean, I've done Broadway and film and TV and... <laughs> Films? Yeah, everything. Um, but I haven't mastered any of it. You know, I've only done this hosting job since September, and I'm always learning things. I'm always figuring things out. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep sort of working on all of it and things sort of evolve out of that. So mm -hmm. we'll see where it takes me. We'll be watching. Thank, Thank you. you Pleasure, Raymond. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you.